So in today's lecture, we're going to discuss how to effectively communicate in business and professional com uh, communication settings. And I created a 10-step message crafting process that you can use to really help ensure that you uh, create effective messages when in business and professional settings. And so you can use this to really ensure uh, that you're successful in those communications. So the very first step is to analyze the situation. And when you're doing this, you're really defining what the purpose of your communication is, and you're going to start to develop an audience profile. So say, for instance, your boss asks you to communicate to um, all of the employees of the company the details about the upcoming company picnic. Well, the very first thing that you're going to do there is analyze that situation. Say, okay, well, the purpose of this is to communicate to the employees of the company the details of an upcoming company picnic. And so the second step is going to be you're going to gather information. So you're going to determine what the audience needs to know and you're going to obtain the information necessary to satisfy those needs of the audience. So let's think about it. What are some of the things an audience might need to know about a company picnic? Well, when is it? Where is it? What time is it? Do they need to bring anything? How long will it last? Are there plans for al uh, um, alternate plans if it's going to be held outside and the weather's better? There's all of these things that people might need to know about an upcoming company picnic. So you're going to do that when you gather information and you're going to write all of that down and then you're going to see, okay, what else does this audience need? And if there's information there that you think the audience is going to need, well, you're going to clarify that from the people who can clarify that, your boss or whoever else is planning the picnic. And then you will then move to the next step, which is selecting the right medium. Now, the communication medium just refers to how is it that you're going to communicate that message? Are you going to communicate that face-to-face -face through verbal conversation? Are you going to send someone a text message? Are you going to send them an email? An electronic message? Maybe you're going to craft a memo. So there are different reasons why we would use some of these communication mediums, and they each have a benefit, and sometimes they have a specific purpose. So for instance, uh, if you look at the guy's right hand, you'll see a memo. Well, if you have paid any attention to the political climate, of the 2016 presidential campaign and election, you will know that memos have been in the news a lot. So a memo is something that you would create and craft in order to record your experiences about a particular communication. So if you talk to your boss and your boss tells you something and you go back to your desk and you think, you know what, I think somebody might need to know that at some point in the future. Um, I'm going to write a memo. I'm going to write this down and craft a memo. A lot of times those memos are kept secret. They're just between you and the event that you need them. Sometimes they're internal. Maybe you send that memo if you think your company needs to be aware of something that you feel is unethical that maybe someone is doing or the company is doing, and you'll send that memo to internal people within the organization, right? And then you've heard of a whistleblower. Whistleblowers are people who generally use a memo or other documents and they give that to someone in the public uh, when they feel that a company has not actually satisfied or, or uh, fixed whatever problem that they brought to their attention. So you see things like that with a memo. We often see uh, emails as a basic form of business communication, but there are also specific times that you might want to email someone. And that is, in the in instance of a company picnic, well, you're probably not going to want to send everyone a, a text message and you're probably not going to want to call each of those people on the phone, and you're probably not going to want to ask each of those employees to come by your office to talk about the picnic. So in that instance, an email is probably going to be the best medium. You can simply choose that email, uh, send that email out, ask people for uh, any questions that they have or suggestions or input, and then you communicate via the whole process via email. Email is also good when you're communicating about something that would require an electronic footprint and what I mean by that is so say you're a boss and you're communicating with an employee 
that they violated a code of conduct for your organization and they're going to be put on written warning and your company's policy is that people get two written warnings before they're fired and so you're going to want a record of that so you might send an email to your employee that says I really uh, appreciate uh, your time today in talking about XYZ as you know your first written warning is now into effect and please let me know how I can help in the future yada 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 well that would create an electronic footprint which says hey we've had this conversation you're acknowledging we've had this conversation and now there's an electronic record so you want to choose the correct communication medium the next step is going to be to organize that information so if we go back to the company picnic example you're going to determine, you, you've now uh, analyzed what the purpose is, you've gathered all the information you need that you think the audience is going to need, you've decided that you're going to send an email to everyone because it's going to be simple and easy, much easier way to communicate to them. So now you're going to organize that information. So you're going to start to write things down and you're going to say, okay, well, these are the things that I need to communicate to them um, in this order and with this approach and so you're going to start to outline that content so you can see what it looks like then you're going to adapt that message to your audience and to your audience needs so uh, this is understanding tone and the use of tone so if you're talking about a company picnic you might want to strike a cordial tone um, a happy tone right looking forward to seeing you might end it with or start it with we're very excited to announce our upcoming annual company picnic we really hope everyone can can participate we had a, a blast last year when we had the picnic right so that type of language that type of tone is going to be ad adapted to the audience based off of what that message is give you a different scenario where tone might be different you you found out as employees that your company is about to conduct layoffs because times are bad and your management sends out an email that says we want to address this rumor about company layoffs it is true we're going through some tough times however our goal is not to allow that to affect our actual workforce and our employees we understand this is a stressful time and we want to address this rumor in the following ways so you're not going to send that message with a positive tone you want to be respectful of the fact that people are upset and that people are concerned about the law, possible loss of their job and so you're going to adapt those messages based off of the audience and what the message is that you're communicating the next step in the process is that we're going to compose the message so this is where we actually write it down and we actually craft what the message is going to look like then we're going to revise it so we're going to go back and we're going to make we're going to make sure that that message is clear and concise that it's accurate and that it's complete and those are things that we're going to talk about in this lecture how to do that effectively the next step is going to be to produce that message and with producing the message you'll see here that we can use effective design elements so do you want to just send an email with a bunch of text and information or do you actually want to create and craft an invitation like this it has all of the relevant information there I did my wedding invitations myself it was a lot of fun in terms of picking the graphics and text and font and at some point it actually became overwhelming but I had a lot of pride in the fact that I did that myself and that it looked nice and so the audience in that case people coming to my wedding uh, really did appreciate uh, appreciate that versus just getting a letter in the mail with a bunch of text hey we're having a wedding here's where it's at we'd like for you to come right so you're gonna produce that and use elements of design if you'd like to and then you're gonna proofread it you're gonna look over it and make sure that it's correct that there's no spelling issues that everything is there properly and then lastly you're gonna deliver that message and when you deliver that message you're gonna choose how you're gonna deliver it in this case we've already decided we're gonna do email that that's the best way to communicate and then we're gonna send that message out so that's a basic 10-step process for writing effective business messages now that we've talked about the process that you can use I want to give you some some tools that you can use to ensure that those messages that you're crafting are effective business messages and I, I created this I call it Dr. C's five C's of effective business writing and they're pretty clear they're pretty easy five C's are is your writing 
clear? Is it concise? Is it complete? Is it correct? And is it courteous? I want to talk about what these mean. So clear means is the message easily understood? If you're writing to talk about the upcoming company picnic, is it clear? Are people going to read that message and clearly understand what the purpose of that message is? Well, if you're sending an invitation that looks like the one that we looked at, that would be a pretty clear message. And I would say that you've done a really good job. So you want to make sure that when you send some a message that they actually are able to understand. You've probably all received a message from someone, maybe a boss, at some point in your, uh, your, your life. And you open that message, you read it. And you think to yourself, what the hell are they talking about? And then you go back and you read it again. And sometimes you're even more confused than the first time you read it. And so you want to avoid that. You want to make sure that when someone gets a communication from you, that that message, that intent is clearly understood. The next C is it, is it concise. And concision is important because you've also all gotten those super long emails from people that are like two pages long, no paragraphs, one huge block of text, and you see it and you automatically go, <sighs> right? You've been there. We all know that feeling because it's not concise. We're very busy people. We live busy lives. We're always from point A to point B and we're easily distracted. We've talked about that as being an issue that we face in terms of affecting our ability to communicate and to listen. And so we need to understand that, that people have short attention spans. And because of that, brevity in business writing is actually appreciated. The third C is, is it complete? Completeness refers to, are you telling them everything they need to know? So it's that audience awareness component of, the, of crafting a message. Is the message complete? Right? If, if we're talking about a picnic, and we've identified that they need to know when the picnic is, where it's at, what to bring, what time to leave, etc. Is all of that information there? Does, do we have everything in that message that that audience needs to know in order to have a successful, um, for it to be a successful communication? Is it complete? Are they going to have everything they need? The fourth thing is, is it correct? And that goes back to proofreading. So we don't want to send out an invitation that has the wrong date and then have to send a revision to the invitation and say, oh, I'm sorry, but the invitation received had the wrong date. Please disregard that and use this invitation instead because I can guarantee you someone will not get that second invitation or someone will and they'll misplace the first one or someone will get that second one and then they'll have both of them and they won't know and then people are going to be showing up for an event on the wrong day or at the wrong time or at the wrong place and that's going to come back on you and that's going to damage your reputation so you want to make sure that it is correct the content is correct and the last of my five C's of effective writing is courteous and that deals with tone like the example I mentioned earlier you want to make sure that you strike the appropriate tone for the type of message that you're sending because when and tone is difficult so when we talk about tone, it's not always easy to understand someone's tone via message. And so we, we may often have to add additional steps to our writing to make sure that we can get our tone across. Now, here's an example from uh, a kindergartner's homework. Think back to when you were in elementary school and you were reading your books, your, your uh, kindergarten and first grade books. And it's very simple. Here's a cat. We see an apple. I see a dog. We see the dog and the cat, see the dog. And I say this because if we were to actually go back and, and communicate in that way in terms of business writing, it is better. But I also understand the reason why students have a hard time switching between academic and business writing. Because as students, you have been trained by professors to be wordy, right? That's why... There's things like word counters, and people will say, well, you have to complete a 5,000-word essay. And then as you read the, as the professor reads the essay, every other word is A, the, and the. You use all of these words. You make things up. You become very wordy because there is a word limit. And that's bad. That's bad training for you because professionally, brevity is what's valued in business writing because time is money. You've probably heard that expression. You, don't, you want your employees working. You don't want them having to spend 
excessive amounts of time communicating or having to reread and reread things in order to understand messages. Uh, so you want people to get to the point. There's no word counters, no word uh, counting in business writing. So let's look, if we talk about clarity, that first of my five C's. Sentence clarity is important, right? Let's look at this example. The manifestation of the existential paradigm is infinitesimally larger than the exponentially evolved humanistic peon. Indeed, this precept is fundamentally beyond the cognizance of any finite mind. Does anyone know what that means? I've used that example for years, and I still have to stop and reread it and reread it to ensure that I get it. But what it really means is just that it's hard to explain this topic. That's what that big sentence really means, is that talking about something that is very hard to grasp. Uh, but instead of saying that, they use all these big fancy words. Let's look at another example. Today we'll, we'll consider the peculiar disadvantages inherent in pontificating at great length on obscure Egyptian hieroglyphics to a class of remedial students with a disastrously abbreviated attention span and a lamentable absence of both intellect and industry, leading inevitably to a complete lack of comprehension from them and incipient despair in the pedagogue. Wow. What a wordy unclear sentence. Really what they're saying there is it's a teacher who says today we're going to talk about the difficulty of teaching Egyptian hieroglyphics to students because students have short attention spans and sometimes they're just not smart and sometimes they're just not creative. Right? Intellect referring to uh, intelligence, industry referring to creativity. And as a result of that, it frustrates me as a teacher. That's really what that teacher is saying there, right? They're saying, you know, try to talk to my students about Egyptian hieroglyphics. They were remedial students. They didn't have the attention span to listen to it. They really weren't smart enough to understand it. They're not creative students. And I am just frustrated as a teacher. But instead of saying that, they use all of these words big words, fancy words, and as a result, the sentence is unclear. So you just want to make sure that, that, that your communication is clear, and sometimes simple is better, right? Again, this is a result of your academic teachings, where your academic teaching says, hey, wordy is better, and we need all of these big words, and we want it to sound smart for academic writing. In business and professional communication, clarity is valued and concision is valued. So avoid stuff like this. Just get to the point. Tell us what you want to say. So if we go now to concision, we talked about the importance of concision and clarity and completeness. We can look at things like sentence length in terms of concision. Right? This is one big sentence. I would ask you to read this. I would read it to you, but I don't think we even have to go there. We can look simply there at the huge paragraph of text and the footnote that says it's the longest sentence in the, um, of three men in a boat written by J.K. Jerome. That is one sentence. You can look at the commas and the hyphens and the, and the uh, colons and semicolons. That is one sentence. So that's one big long breath that you're going to try to read that big, that big sentence. It's not clear, and it's not concise, and no one has the time to read that. So you want to make sure that you do practice concision. Now, when we talk about form, paragraphs is also important. You've probably seen things like this. That's one huge paragraph. If you get that in an email, you're not going to want to read it. right? I get emails from students that long, and I think, God, I, I sigh. There's an audible sigh. Like, like, oh, wow, like, this is not going to be fun to read, right? And it's because it just, it's chunky. It doesn't look right to the human eye. And as a result of that, we feel, we feel despair when we look at it. Really, we don't want to read it. And so you can do that by breaking up the text into using common paragraphs. And I, I give this example and because it is important, um, because sometimes I think people forget what a paragraph is, like it's this big puzzle. How do I put together a paragraph successfully? Well, here's an old um, photo that will help, right? Think about a paragraph as a hamburger bun. 
and you, your top bun is your introduction your topic statement everything in between the meat the tomatoes the cheese lettuce onion pickle what whatever you want on your hamburger that is the stuff in the middle and that's a few sentences that explain or tell us about whatever the topic is of that paragraph and then you're going to have a concluding sentence or some sentence that allows us to transition into the next uh, into the next paragraph and so you never want one huge thing of text like this because there's too many thoughts and too much stuff in there and we don't have time or want to read that right so we should make it look like this if this was an email I got it's a pretty long email, pretty substantial, a lot of information there. However, it is written in a way that allows me to easily read it. And so I don't look at this with despair and say, oh gosh, this is going to be horrible to read. I look at it and say, okay, well, let's read it. And so you want to make sure that you use appropriate paragraphs and sentence structure uh, in your writing when you're writing in business and professional settings because you want, be, you want people to be able to easily access and find the information. Uh, that you're talking about, not one huge block of text. I might even put some bullet points in here, right? If there's some things I specifically wanted to highlight, that would allow my audience the opportunity to go through that information and easily reference it versus that huge paragraph. You're not going to be able to reference anything there. Now, we're, um, we're almost through the lecture, and so I want to uh, commend you. You're probably feeling really good about effective communication and writing right now. You probably feel as good as this young baby body bodybuilding. Go! <laughs> now, hopefully that made you smile. And gives you a little bit of energy to get through the last bit of our lecture here. So we've talked about clarity, concision, completeness, and we talk about uh, it being correct and it being courteous. Courteous, again, referring to that tone of voice. And this is pretty true, that it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And so you've probably heard this in your in your day-to-day -day life, right? You say something and someone's like, well, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. And it made me angry and it hurt my feelings. But in electronic communication, when we're writing and crafting messages that we're sending electronically, it's, it requires an extra effort to make sure that our tone is appropriate. And you might think, oh, well, we have emojis and emoticons that we can use. It's not hard at all, Dr. Curry. Well, you don't actually want to use emoticons or emojis in business and professional communication. Maybe if you're in a text message with colleagues or someone and you know them and you're at that level where you can, but promise me you won't be sending uh, emojis in your work emails. It's just not professional, so make sure it's professional and avoid that. Although I do agree, it would help with tone and that's a benefit of emojis. Right? Here's a perfect, right? You wouldn't want to reply back to the email about the company picnic with this. You wouldn't want to send out the, yeah, right? Maybe you just say, company picnic, Saturday, 12 o'clock, Myers Park. Here's your emojis. If you don't understand what that means, Google it. You'll enjoy it, I assure you. So we can improve our communication in the way that we write. And I want to look at some of these examples. Uh, it's important, especially important, to use clear communication when you are in a position where you're over someone. So if you have authority over someone, you especially want to be clear because that lack of clarity can really create stress for your employees. So for instance, my boss's name is Dave. He's my department chair. If Dave sends me this email and says, Rick, can you come by my office today after class? I'd like to discuss a few things with you. I am going to be stressed. I'm going to be worried. I'm going to be thinking, what did I do? Right? What's going on? Why does he need to see me? So sometimes I might reply back because Dave was ambiguous. His communication was unclear. I might actually reply back and say, sure, Dave, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to stop by when I finish up at 1220. Can you tell me the purpose of the meeting? Maybe Dave's busy and Dave's in class and he doesn't reply back. Now I'm going to worry even more. I'm going to be checking my email uh, throughout class. I'm going to be looking and seeing, okay, has he responded? Because I'm going to be nervous. So you want to remove that nervousness, that stress from your employees' lives. And you can do that by just being more clear. 
So instead of that previous paragraph, Dave could say, Rick, I hope you had a great day and that your morning goes well. If you have some free time this afternoon, can you stop by my office for a few minutes? I'd like your help in looking at some speech ass uh, assignment options for a speech class for fall semester. Have a great day, Dave. So you can see there the tone of that, the clarity of that is much better than the original message. Now I know you're probably thinking, well, Dr. Curry, you just told us that we had to be concise, and now you've doubled the length of the message. Well, this is one of those instances where you can actually violate that. It's okay to violate the concision principle there. It's okay to, to have more and to go into more depth and detail here because you're communicating about something that could create stress or negatively affect someone in the communication. And so in those instances, more communication is better because it makes the communication clear. So always communicate in a clear and concise manner, but the, the clarity, the clearness of that message takes precedent over the concision of that message. So use as many words as you need to use in order to make sure that you are clear in your communication. Right? Write that one, not that one. We want to adopt the you attitude, and this is the philosophy that the customer is always right. You've probably heard this, especially if you have um, any working experience, because in customer service, the customer is always right. Now, we know the customer is actually not always right. Any of you who have worked with people know that the customer is not always right. But because companies need those customers and they need those customers to come back and buy their products and continue to shop at their business that's why the customer is always right because the customer is always right as long as as long as you want their money and that's important practice for businesses and that's why businesses will adopt that customer first mentality and so if you adopt that that customer is right that customer first mentality what you're really doing is you're you're adopting an audience-centered approach, right? That is understanding who the audience is. The audience in that case is a customer. Then your communication with them is gonna be one in which your tone has to be respectful. And you have to center your communication on understanding what that customer's needs are and how you can make something right. So when you adopt that attitude, uh, especially in both speaking and writings, it really can increase your ability to have successful communication. Let's look at some examples of where you want to avoid the you mentality. Customer calls in, they've got a problem with their router. Hi, I tried installing the wireless router in my apartment, but I'm not getting any signals out of it. Your response, okay, tell me what steps you took and we'll see what you did wrong. You can see there, it's problematic. What do you mean, did wrong? I followed the exact instructions exactly. Well, we will see, did you install the software before connecting the LAN cable as the manual says? So you see here, this customer service agent is using the you mentality and that, that approach makes the customer feel like they did something wrong, like they're the ones to blame. Maybe the agent didn't mean, that, mean it that way, but because they use that approach, that customer is not gonna be happy regardless of the outcome of this conversation. And so let's look at it from a different approach. Hi, I tried installing the wireless router in my apartment, but I'm not getting any signals out of it. I'm sorry you're having trouble. Let's go through your, set, through your setup and see if we can find the problem. Great, thanks. Can you tell me which of the small green lights on the front of the router are lit up? So you see there how that customer thinks, okay, well, they're being friendly, they're being nice, and they're going to solve my problem. And we didn't place any blame at all on the customer in that instance. So you want to avoid that you mentality. It will help you in regards to that. Lastly, as we look, we've we want to maintain standards of etiquette. And etiquette, you've probably heard this, you'll catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. That just refers to the principle of being nice. That when you're nice to people, people will respond better to you, they will communicate better with you, and you're going to have a better overall um, experience with them, right? I like this, kind words will unlock an iron door meaning sometimes people can be very difficult, but if you're nice to somebody, people will let you in, right? We appreciate that kindness uh, in people, and honestly, the world needs a lot more kindness. So we can practice this. Let's look at an example. So say you are a boss, and 
you've got an employee and they crash the company website. They programmed it incorrectly and it's costing your company time and money. You might want to be angry and you might say, well, once again, Rick, you've managed to bring down the website through your incompetent programming. It's going to make me feel pretty bad. I'm, I'm not going to be encouraged or motivated to fix the problem. And I'm probably not going to be encouraged or motivated to come back to work the next day because I'm going to feel bad about myself and my future with that company. So as a boss, I might say something like, Rick, let's review the last website update and let's explore some ways that we can improve that process. So I know I did wrong. You don't need to tell me. You don't need to berate me and make me feel bad because I already know. So you can just say, let's review it. Let's look for some ways to improve the process and you'll have the same result. Here's another. Um, maybe you're working for a company and you have requested parts um, or you need something office supplies and it's been weeks and you haven't gotten it. So you email or you call the parts distributor and you say, gosh, you guys have been sitting on our order for two weeks now. We need it now. Actually, I needed it yesterday. What's going on? People are going to sense that tone. In that e if that's an email, they're going to sense the tone. Right? We need it now, exclamation, exclamation. Or if you're talking and you talk like that, they're going to sense the tone and the frustration, and you're probably not going to get the best response. So instead of saying that, you can say the same thing effectively with this. Our production schedules depend on the timely delivery of parts and supplies, but we have not yet received the order scheduled for delivery two weeks ago. Please confirm today the delivery commitment. Thanks, Rick. Right? You see there, please is bolded. And the emphasis there on please is because it indicates tone, but it also says what you want, which is please confirm today the delivery commitment. So you're not asking them. You're not saying, hey, can you check on this for me? You're saying, hey, this is important to us. It affects our business in negative ways, and I need to know today. And so, but you've done it in a nice way. And again, kindness will unlock doors. A lot of doors, right? So that's important standard there. And when we talk about bad news, we talked about the example of laying people off, et cetera. You really want to emphasize the positive if you're conveying bad news. Um, so maybe uh, you work at Best Buy and you deal with laptop repair, or maybe Apple. Let's say you're with Apple. And customer has, they come in and their laptop's broke, and you're a student, and you really need that laptop for your assignments. You got to do your uh, your D2L assignments, you've got to log into the online class, you've got to do all of these other assignments that are required. And they tell you, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Brian. It's impossible to, it's impossible to repair your laptop today. That's going to make me feel bad. That's going to put me into despair. And so what you could say is, the positive aspect, Brian, your computer is going to be ready by Tuesday. Would you like a loaner until then? So what you've done now is you've emphasized the positive. The good news is going to be ready by Tuesday. You don't have to wait two weeks. It's going to be ready next Tuesday. And you're anticipating, you're anticipating um, concerns. And so you're saying, would you like a loaner until then? Right? You understand that the computer is valuable and important to that person. And so you can offer them a loaner so they can still have a way of doing their work. People are going to respond much better than you say, well, sorry, I can't fix it today. I can't. I'm sorry. Right? Maybe you made a really bad suggestion to your boss that they hire your best friends from college. And it just didn't work out. Your boss says, hey, Stacy, we wasted $20,000 in training expenses on hiring those stupid employees that you recommended. You recommended them, Stacy. Of course, Stacy knows she recommended them. She felt bad when they quit. She felt bad that it didn't work out, and she knows you you spent a lot of time and money on that. So you could say something like, "Well, Stacy, our twenty thousand dollar training investment didn't pay off this time, but let's analyze this ex experience and apply the insights that we've learned to our future hires, so hopefully those work out better." So you still. You've still indicated, you know, you've expressed disappointment, you've expressed the cost, $20,000, but again, you've done it in a positive way. So you see here the tone 
is very important when conveying bad news. Tone is important with all of these messages, right? It's especially important to communicate positively, clearly, and clearly with your employees because we value, companies value human capital, meaning they are only, that company only exists because of the people who work for it. That company will not exist if everyone walks out and doesn't come back to work the next day. So that human capital, that experience that each of you bring to the table is what makes that company valuable. And so companies under, need to understand that and communicate in a way to their employees, uh, which is clear and effective. And so as you go out into the workforce and you work for companies, practice those steps, practice that 10 step process, practice those five C's, and you will be much better communicators. You will increase your own human capital, human capital and your boss and other people around you will think of you as a positive communicator. 